Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today is Friday. It's a self-improvement Friday and my friend John is here to present. Uh, he's back looking at Aesop fables, one of his favorites. He keeps coming back mm -hmm. to them. And uh, today is about complaining. So take it away, John. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, firstly, on that note, I think I've, I've been blown away by Aesop's fables because growing up, obviously, we all implicitly know like the basic ones, tortoise and the hare, etc. Um, and once I got into them as an adult, I loved the succinctness, like they're so consolidated and, and um, not watered down at all. It's just right to the point. Um, and I love the fact that they're embodied in terms of like narratives and metaphors and like these weird animals and stuff like that. So there's a lot of symbolism. So, I mean, this, I'll probably come, I'll probably return to a lot of these in the future. Um, I think they're very efficient ways to, to, to express principles um, in terms of what children and adults can understand. Uh, can um, I so, tell you a little story about Aesop? I don't know whether sure, you know yeah. this or not. Yeah, please. So Aesop was a slave. Yeah. Anyway, and yeah. he was uh, bought, he was, he was kind of he was short, very heavy and bow legged. Mm -hmm. So he was bought uh, by a new master mm -hmm. and all the other slaves and, and the master was going out for a trip and they had, the slaves had to carry a lot of weight. So the other slaves kind of took pity on him and said, you know, you're, you're kind of small and you know, you have these leg problems. So you get to pick whatever you want to, whatever parcel you want to carry. So he looks at all the past parcels and picks the biggest one, mm -hmm. biggest one. Um, and they, they just look at him, are you crazy? You could have picked this small, small things and yeah. carried Why? He said, no, no, no I'll, I'll carry this. You know, it took him like a couple of people have to pick it up and put it on his head and they go. And within, within about just, 15 minutes, it was an all day trek. Uh, within about half an hour, they stop for food. And what he has mm -hmm. picked is the food package. And it's completely, yeah. you know, by the time wow. you know, they sit down, it's all, all filled. So so he, he always funny. calculates uh, in time. All right, yep. uh, take it away, John. That's funny, that's funny, thank you. Um, so today we are talking about the fable titled The Young Crab and His Mother. It's sometimes titled The Two Crabs. Um, and if you haven't read it, totally fine. It's like three sentences long. So we're going to go into it now and I'm going to analyze it. Um, I guess some like tangential lessons I've extracted from it, but the main one is critiquing versus complaining. We're going to talk a lot about that today. So the young crab and his mother from Aesop uh, is as follows. Why in the world do you walk sideways like that? Said a mother crab to her son. You should always walk straight forward with your toes turned out. Show me how to walk, mother dear, answered the crab obediently. Answered the little crab obediently. I want to learn. So the mother crab tried and tried to walk straight forward, but she could only walk sideways like her son. And when she wanted to turn her toes out, she tripped and fell on her nose. And the, the summarization in Aesop's words are, do not tell others how to act unless you can set a good example. So I mean, that, that's, the, that's the, I would say, superficial lesson we can all extract there on, on the surface. But if we look a little bit deeper, if we look at the verbiage and, and the, uh, I guess, deeper little implications here. Um, firstly, what stood out to me is the second sentence that the mother crab says to her son. She says, you should always she didn't say like it would be better, it would be more efficient, you might be faster, you might be more comfortable. She said you should always. And when I read that, it sounds like she attached emotion in that statement, like there's some type of value structure, there's some type of like, um, I don't know, sense of superiority, like you're, you're a greater crab if you walk this way, you should always walk this way, etc. So I think that is interesting. And it made me think of the phenomenon of projecting, as we all know. So Oftentimes, when we look at a subject, um, if I see a, I don't know, we can, we can both look at any random subject as, as an experiment. And I can say this person is, and like whatever that judgment of that person is, says more about me than it does about the person. Because two of us can have different interpretations, different opinions on somebody who we have never met. So, right. So we don't have any experience to validate truth or, or falsehood of that statement of our judgment but it's all subjective about where we are with our relationship with ourselves. So oftentimes we and other people, this works both ways. Oftentimes we project onto other people, things that we are insecure about, things that we haven't really addressed yet, things that we might want to implement, but we 
we've neglected or we might feel inferior. Or we might have this little complex about it. Um, and like I said, it works conversely as well. So when, when you realize how often you are, I would say a canvas for people to project their insecurities at, you will stop taking so much things personal. It is extremely, extremely helpful to realize that when you are being critiqued. Now, is there some utility in criticism? Absolutely. I'm not saying every single you know, contravening comment towards you or towards your competence or towards what you did is wrong. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying oftentimes it is projection. Um, and how to validate that, it might be like if you get multiple criticisms along the same lines from a lot of people, maybe there's some validity in that because obviously they have all different experiences. So they might not all be projecting the same criticism, you might say. But if it's one instance or if it's very emotional in the case of like this mother saying, you should always do this, you should do this, and they're not doing it themselves, you can probably be sure it's, it's projection, especially if they haven't. I guess, implemented or embodied the lesson that they're trying to impose on you. Um, so I think that's always something to, to look out for um, and have the awareness that a lot of people in their, in their criticism are projecting um, their insecurities. People tend to externalize for some reason, which is actually one of the breakout group questions we're going to get into in a few minutes, why people do that, why it's such a prominent phenomena in human relationships. Um, the second thing I realized, looking a little bit deeper at the text chosen, um, is from the young crab, obviously, where he's the first thing he says to his mom, he's not, you know, he's not reluctant to learn. He's like open minded. He says, OK, I'm willing to learn. But the first thing he says is show me. He doesn't say tell me. He says show me. And there's I, I've talked about this before. I think personally, I think people learn best at the school of example. Um, we've talked about this actually in a different Aesop fable called the Quack Frog. Right. You should practice what you preach. And this one was, of course, the quack frog who said, oh, I have all these potions. It's going to cure you of your ailments. But him himself was sick. So he's not he hasn't really utilized his lessons. He hasn't practiced what he's preached, so to speak. Um, and it's it, it's interesting to note that that's literally the first thing he said is show me. So um, I've, I've brought this up in the past. I think there is a threshold between information, knowledge, and wisdom. Some of you who are regulars have heard me talk about this before, but for anybody who knew, I, how I define this threshold, this hierarchy between information and like how you can determine whether somebody's like preaching or practicing what they preach is the following. So firstly, you have information and this is data. This can be just facts. It could be opinions. It could be just information from social media, whatever is coming into your input, right? That's like the, I would say most, um, omnipresent reality that's like accessible everywhere we look data information okay second would be knowledge it's a little bit higher in the pyramid so it's a little bit filtered and it's filtered through a certain process um one of two processes one the data is filtered through okay is this truth or is this fiction like is this correct or incorrect that's the first filter the second filter can be like useful or irrelevant so in terms of like useful or relevant it obviously depends on your goals it depends on what you're looking for in the world it depends on what you're trying to do right so that's subjective between person to person is what is useful, right? Information about a random event or a random, like, like, I don't know, engineering or mathematics or physics can be very useful to some person, but obviously not another person. So that's the second filter. And that's why there's two filters, but that is not enough. That is still not enough. Finally become, finally comes the, the, I guess, ascending up the hierarchy of the pyramid to the top. I would say that is wisdom. And personally, I, I this is not like the Webster definition by any means, but how I define wisdom is like, knowledge that you have applied to a definite end and then you've reflected on your process you reflect you reflected on your experiences on your experiments um, and you can determine okay i had this knowledge i had this plan it was filtered it looks good on paper but as we know the world is a lot you know more convoluted than just goals on paper right a lot of things come into context some things we might not have anticipated a lot of context um, some things we might have thought would be effective on paper in our knowledge phase might not be effective. We might have had to recalibrate. We might have had to have feedback from the world first and then we switch our knowledge, you know? So then I, there's another there's another level there. And then when somebody speaks from that level, I think then you can be sure somebody, it's like, it's useful advice. They're practicing what they preach, so to speak. So a, pra a practical example can be, um, let's say I'm looking for a personal trainer. Let's say I wanna lose or gain some muscle or something, lose some weight, uh, get in a little bit more sh better shape. Um, I can I can do several things. I can look for information on the internet, right? Everybody has an opinion. There's thousands of, of, of trainers out there. Um, or I can look for knowledge, which might be, it, it might have validity to it. So you can have somebody who's 
maybe they studied, they went to, they, they've got credentials, they have their personal training license, they have all, all the intellectual knowledge on what to do to gain muscle or lose fat, whatever it is. But here's the thing, maybe they might be out of shape themselves. And if you have two people, somebody who's in shape, you know, they, they've, they've spent, the life, spent their life going throughout these journeys, going throughout these experiments, um, and they're in shape, and you have person B who's out of shape, but they have more intellectual knowledge. Personally, I would choose the person A every single time, because like I said, they've passed that threshold from knowledge to wisdom. Person B, they have, they have credentials, they have credibility, but they haven't implemented that knowledge. So it, it's, kind of, it's kind of hollow, you know what I mean? It's kind of superficial. That's how I would look at it. So I would choose person B, even though they didn't have, even if they didn't have a, a license to train or a credentials or something like that, but they have passed that barrier. They've implemented what they know and they've practiced their philosophy in the real world. They've implemented it and then they, they realize, okay, this is useful and I think it's transferable. Let's find out, you know, let's do these experiments. If it's transferable, here you go. You know what I mean? So that, that's kind of what I've extracted from that. Those literally those two words from the young crab saying, show me. Um, so it's a lot deeper than, than I originally thought when I looked at the, the uh, sentence there. Um, so the underlying theme, like those, those are some kind of tangential themes that I've extracted from, from this. But the main one that I want to talk about here um, is complaining versus critiquing. And sometimes we will use these interchangeably, but I tend to try to err on the side of being precise with language uh, because we have a like English is the most comprehensive language and there's a lot of different words for particular reasons. So we should be very aware of the words we're using uh, and use them with very deliberate intent. So the differentiation between those two words, complaining and critiquing, in my opinion, is the following. Complaining would be me expressing dissatisfaction or discontentment with something. Okay, we all, we all understand it. Just complaining, saying, oh, I don't like this. I hate that. This, 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 whatever. Okay. Critiquing, on the other hand, it's, it's constructive. It's, it's producing something. It is, it's expressing dissatisfaction, similar to complaining. But here's the, here's a differentiation. It provides an alternative. Okay. It's expressing dissatisfaction with, it's, that dissatisfaction is coupled with an improvement or an alternative. Right. So it's saying, I don't like the way you did this. Try this. Or I don't know if that's correct. You should think about this fact. You should think about this perspective. You should think about this opinion. Right. And it sounds trivial. It sounds like superfluous. But if you look at that, there's a lot of deeper implications behind that, um, I guess, dichotomy. If you complain, if you're only complaining about something, you're making the entire predicament, you're making the entire relationship, you're making the entire point only about you. You're, you're only thinking about you. You're only thinking about how you react to the statement or fact or opinion from somebody or philosophy or whatever it happens to be that you disagree with, you're only making it about you. So that's extremely selfish if you're just complaining and saying, I don't like this. I hate that. I don't like that. And it's like, you, you've added nothing to the conversation. You add, you, you've only expressed your feelings and you're making everybody have to cater to that. Right. So I think inherently that's selfish if you look at it that way. Whereas critiquing, um, you know, so, so to, to pass this threshold into critiquing, um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we have to just never complain, right? It doesn't mean we have to meekly um, be timid and, and passive and obsequious and accept everything about the world and accept everybody's opinion and express no discontentment or dissatisfaction with anything, right? That's not the case at all. I'm saying it's okay to be dissatisfied with things. It's absolutely preferred to disagree with things. But what's imperative is that you speak your mind and you share your version of the truth. Right, so Street Khan's fourth rule in all of these meetups: it's okay to disagree with somebody, but do so courteously. Like express your um, proposed philosophy that's that's opposing it. Right, so don't just say like I disagree with that point. Like imagine if this Q and A, for example, was just like, Hey, John, I hate what you said. It's like, okay, what what else? You know what I mean? Like, are you gonna say something else or like, you know? So if it was just critiquing, or if it was sorry, if it was just complaining, it doesn't get anywhere. Like that's the end of the conversation. It's not inviting. It's not an inquiry to explore other philosophies or alternatives. Whereas critiquing is like, hey, John, I don't agree with what you said. Again, totally fine. Here's my alternative. And then we can have a discussion in there. You see what I'm saying? So um, that, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, I guess, meaning behind the phrase constructive criticism. I don't think there's a such thing as constructive complaining, right? That's why we use those terms. Um, so if you look at it, it's kind of, it's destructive versus constructive, right? So critiquing something, or sorry, complaining is just, it's only taking something apart. And we have to be careful that we're not, we have to be careful that we fully transition into critiquing and we don't like 
I would say there's there's a there's a middle ground called pseudo critiquing. It's like it's almost critiquing, but you're not really espousing your own philosophy. And this would be the following example. This would be something like always playing quote unquote contrarian or quote unquote devil's advocate. And all that's doing, it looks like it's criti- it's look, it looks like it's critiquing something, but in reality, all it's doing is taking something and flipping it on its head, right? You're not actually like embodying your own unique experiences and insights and perspectives into the argument. You're only taking something and just flipping it, right? There's no creation there. There's no creativity there. There's no talent. There's no strength there. And somebody who walks around doing this all the time, it doesn't really take, it literally takes no skill. It takes no accountability. It takes no intelligence. It takes no courage, especially to just critique something all the, or pseudo critique something all the time by playing kind of contrarian or just to disagree with everything and say, I hate what this person says. I don't like what that person says. Um, I, I express discontentment at this person or this ideology or this affiliation or political agenda, whatever it happens to be, that's all just destructive. Again, like I said, it takes no competence to do that. Um, and contrarian is it's it's a step in the right direction but it's not fully i would say it's not fully constructive at that point because again you're not putting your own experiences into your words you're not putting um your your philosophy you have nothing on the line so if you play a contrarian if you play devil's advocate what you're what i think people are doing in that sense is they're looking for like validation or agreement on their ideas or fortification or something of their identity without the risk, right? Because if I say what I believe, if I express my philosophy to people, I have, I, I run the risk of embarrassment. I run the risk of um, disagreement. I run the risk of a lot of different psychological turmoil. And we know that implicitly we evolved to hold the, this is actually a verbatim quote from a book called Social by Matthew Lieberman. I brought this up in the past before. Our brains have evolved to ensure we hold the beliefs and values of those around us. So there's a part in the brain and the, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but the same part of the brain that lights up in terms of physical pain also is activated in social pain. So if you guys all just like turned on your mics and just yelled at me, like my brain would light up like I'm actually in pain, right? Because if you look at this evolutionarily speaking, it made sense to conform to the identities and to the beliefs because we only grew up in tribes of like 100 to 120 which is Dunbar's number. And if we were exiled, if I said something like against the whole narrative, if I was like this free thinker, whistleblower type person, those people didn't exist in in primitive times. They were exiled and they died, right? So I literally had to agree to survive. So we still share that conditioning as humans, which is very interesting. Um, So to to superimpose that, for me to express my beliefs, I'm putting something on the line, right? I'm, I'm risking quote unquote pain in my brain center um, and I'm risking criticism. I'm risking being wrong, um, but I think that's imperative for growth and it's imperative to actually think accurately and it's imperative to you know swim through all of the information to get to truth and to get to what's constructive. We have to have disagreements. We have to have these discussions to filter out what we know, uh, what I know versus what you know and kind of find the common ground, find where we disagree, why we disagree, et cetera. Um, and, again, the devil's advocate and contrarian, it's looking for that validation. It's looking for that like um, positive social validation without anything at risk. So if I say, no, that's wrong. You're like, oh, I guess, I guess it is. But I didn't, I didn't, you know, project this from my mind. So I have nothing to, I can just detach myself from that identity or that philosophy because I didn't say anything. Right. So I think it's, it's very, it's very um, sneaky, but I think that's, what's really going on there. Um, And for, for fortification of this point, I want to read a, um, a quote. It's not really a quote. It's kind of a, it's a few. It's a few lines, a little bit longer, um, from a, a phenomenal book that um, Shrikant actually recommended to me, The Fountainhead, um, and it kind of captures this point very well. So, the sentence is as follows. The paragraph is as follows. Um, just weakness and cowardice. It's so easy to run to others. It's so hard to stand on one's own record. You can fake virtue for an audience. You cannot fake it. In your own eyes, your ego is the strictest judge. People run from their ego. They spend their lives running. It's easier to donate a few thousand to charity and think yourself noble than to base self-respect on personal standards of personal achievement. It's simple to seek substitutes for competence, such easy substitutes. 
but there is no substitute for competence. And this, this next point is especially important. I think this really captures the, the idea of the contrarian, somebody like resting their identity on other people, like taking philosophies and only working backward from there without producing anything of their own. This next point is especially pertinent to that. Um, that precisely is the deadliness of second-handers. They have no concern for facts, ideas, work. They're concerned only with people. They don't ask, is this true? They ask, is this what others think is true? Not to judge, but to repeat. Not to do, but to give the impression of doing. Not creation, but show. Very important line there. Um, not ability, but friendship. Not merit, but pull. What would happen to the world without those who do, think, work, produce? That's the most important word there, produce. Like I said, somebody who expresses their own philosophy. Those are the egotists. You don't think through another's brain and you don't work through another's hand. When you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. To stop consciousness is to stop life. Secondhanders have no sense of reality. Their reality is not within them, but somewhere in that space which divides one human body from another. Not an entity, but a relation anchored to nothing. So that concluding uh, sentence is extremely powerful. They are not uh, they are not an entity in themselves, but they are a relation anchored to nothing. So I think that's exactly what somebody is who walks around critiquing everything all day, right? They're taking something that somebody took maybe 10, 20, 30 years, maybe their entire life to build. It could be a work of art. It could be a movie. It could be music. It could be a genre. It could be just a, a book. It could be a, a, their, their ideas, their philosophy, whatever it happens to be. They go around their life and they act in relation to tearing these things down. So again, that's not being an entity in yourself. It's existing as a relation anchored to nothing. So that's extremely um, dangerous. And I've actually seen this like destructive power firsthand. I kind of have a, have a funny story um, from when I started to go to these meetups um, that, that Shri Khan's been hosting for, for years now. When I started going, um, we start, I think it was the summer of 2018, right when Jordan Peterson, I think it was 2018, right when Jordan Peterson released his book, The, the 12 Rules for Life. Um, and we were having a discussion, we were doing a, a chapter every single weekend. And prior to this time, I knew nothing about Jordan Peterson. And some people came to him because, or he kind of came to prominence because of a kind of somewhat controversial political opinion, affiliation, etc. Um, I didn't know anything about that. So I was just looking at like the competence and the merit of his psychological advice, which is like parallel, like unparalleled, unprecedented. He's like, he's phenomenal in his, in, in that realm. So I was like, th like, this is brilliant. Like this, this objective advice he's giving, like his insights and analyses of, of philosophy, of mythology, of archetypes, of order and chaos, of this dichotomy. It's beautifully articulate and it's very useful. So I was like, I was like, I can't really find much that would like, quote unquote, offend people. But of course we did. Um, when we were in one of these um, discussions, we were in a particularly one of these breakout groups. And I remember this person, this older gentleman, he came, he was a newcomer. I haven't seen him, I haven't seen him prior. And it was, it was our time to, I don't remember, we were probably talking about one of these breakout questions or something, expressing our idea or our opinion about like the chapter or whatever it happened to be. And all he said was like, I, I vehemently disagree. Like I'm offended at this. I'm offended. I find this like reprehensible, this, that. And it's like, I remember thinking, I was like, are, are you, do you have anything to add though? Do you know what I mean? Like he's only subtracting from like the argument, which like I said, totally fine to disagree, but like, give me a, a proposition. Give me an alternative. If you think that's incorrect, provide me with what you believe to be correct. And we'll discuss it. Absolutely. I'm not like condemning him for disagreeing by any means, but I thought it was interesting that he literally had nothing to add. It was like, I'm offended. I'm this, I'm that. It makes me feel bad. And it's like, you could have just not said anything and the conversation would have flowed better. You know what I mean? Because he didn't add anything of substance. It was only taking what was in the ether, what was in this mental realm of conversation and just deducing it down and saying, I don't like that. It's the picking, picking, picking this apart, picking this apart, destroying it without providing context for us to actually build um, productively and move forward in a conversation with. So I thought that was um, kind of a, a embodiment of this like devil's advocate critique um, kind of, uh, or complaining rather um, philosophy, I would say. Um, so in summation, um, very simple, one word, create, don't complain. So it's totally fine to critique things. It's completely fine to disagree with something as vehemently, as passionately, as fervently as you possibly want to. 
that's completely fine. Um, one of my favorite quotes is where all think alike, none think very much. So disagreement is actually imperative to become um, more, you know, uh, reconciled with the road of constructive truth and and valid information. That's imperative, right? It's not it's not good when people all agree on one thing, um, unless they've arrived at that conclusion. That's a little bit different. Um, but it's totally fine to disagree with something. But when you do disagree with something, when you're expressing discontent with something, when you're expressing dissatisfaction in any realm of life with with your partner, with your job, with somebody who's doing a bad job at your office, don't just say something and like destroy it. It's fine to destroy it, but then don't leave it there. Destroy it and then provide an alternative or an addition, right? So I think that that's a good, um, I guess, summarization phrase. Create, don't complain. So with that said, I'll pass it over to Srikant to moderate Q&A. Thanks, John. Great presentation as always. Uh, the first up, so we've got four four rules for, uh, for the Q&A and for interaction. Number one, type exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom to uh, speak or ask questions. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind and do so courteously. Joe, you're first. Hi, uh, thanks for presenting again, John. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, one of the things I think about when I think about the differences between critique and complain, and I've thought about this a little bit, particularly with people at work, is that critiques usually come with a certain amount of data and information where in objective truth, whereas complaining is mostly just an emotional act that has like no alternative as you just referred to like so would you say that would be the one distinction is that there's actual some facts like that would be in in uh critiquing versus complaining is just you know you're speaking just purely on emotion and and it, and it e may even be valid emotion but it's still it, there's nothing mm -hmm. under underpinning it yeah, that's actually a good distinction. It, it makes me think of the discussion we had about like the, the two frogs in the well going back to another Aesop's table, like versus logic versus emotion, right? So I think that's a really good analysis. Like there's data, you know what I mean? Like if someone's, if your boss or some higher up or some executive, whatever is showing you, hey, look, this is your, this was your quota. This was your sales goal, whatever it happened to be. Um, these are your current numbers. Like that's not complaining. That's like, that's objective advice. Like, hey, do whatever you have to do to get back on track. Um, while you were speaking, I actually go quickly Googled like the, the definition of critique. Um, it is follows a detailed analysis and assessment of something especially a uh, literary phil philosophical or political theory so detailed analysis and assessment right so it's like that's rooted in logic or rational thinking of course right and i think we implicitly know this when we say like i'm a i'm a movie critique i'm an art critique right nobody says i'm an art complainer right you know what i mean it kind of sounds redundant it kind of sounds humorous when you put it that way i'm an art complainer i just express what i hate about this painting what i hate about this time period right um whereas art critique they can say like oh like look at these brush strokes look at this proportion look at the symmetry look at the ratios of like the shapes and the perspective etc like they're looking a little bit more analytical at it and more objective as you can say like with that distinction i think that's really accurate and one of the really quickly is one of the distinctions that I thought about is the idea of data and how information knowledge lead to wisdom, but you need data to be part of that. You can't just Absolutely. be wise without data. So without some objective Absolutely. fact. So that was one or the other. Absolutely. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Positive feedback loop upward from there. Yeah, right. Excellent. Next up is uh, Cheryl. Cheryl, go ahead. Hi, John. Um, I think when I think about the crab and his mother and, um, I, it makes me think like, um, is the mother crab supposed to think that the crab, the younger crab is somehow limited, um, by the same constraints that she is because she knows she's a crab and he's a crab. So therefore I shouldn't expect any more of the next generation. Can you, can you rephrase the question specifically? Yeah, I'm just asking kind of like, is the person with the critique responsible for making sure that whatever solution they suggest is feasible for the person they're suggesting it to? Like, is it unreasonable for a mother to think that her child could walk differently than her? 
because she can only walk a certain way is it reasonable for her to just think he can only walk a certain way so why would i ask him to walk a different way right well yeah absolutely very very deep uh interesting line of questioning um so i think it's it's pertinent to the to the first i guess theme that i've extracted which was the the whole projecting thing um where she says you should always do this like this is what i believe about the world this is what i believe about the nature of what it means to be a crab etc like whatever beliefs she held i mean it's it's simplistic because obviously they're crabs right so it's not like it's a little bit it's not as dynamic as like a human of course but um my analysis would be like that's her own belief system projecting onto um, the crab. Maybe if there's like a father crab and he says like, oh, you should be the best sideways walker that you can be. You know what I mean? Like that's a little bit different of, of a proposition, of course, but like that might be the father's uh, or a different crab's belief about like the world or what it means to be a crab projecting onto this. But I thought it was particularly interesting about why she said like, you should always do this. You should all like, that's the best way to walk for et cetera. But, and like, she didn't do it herself, but you could also twist it and look at it another way, where it's like she might want, quote unquote, the best for her son. So it's like maybe her idea of like what it means to be a perfect crab is to walk forward. You know what I mean? But it's like so she's just like thinking like, oh, maybe my son, my son will be better than me in some way. So she's trying to encourage him to be better. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different ways you can look at the story. Um, but I, I chose to look at it through the lens of like projection. You know what I mean, it's like somebody realizes an insecurity in themselves that they're not like it's just not sitting with them. It, it, produces guilt or shame or something like that and they're projecting they're 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 engaging in a psychological phenomenon called displacement and they and they place that onto another person because it makes them insecure it makes them uncomfortable whatever happens to be or they or they get like they feel like a sense of lowered value or or inferior from having this attribute of walking sideways so they're trying to project on other people and say like oh you should do this you should do that you should do that instead of like should which is what we were talking about in a prior meetup like you should turn all of your shoulds into musts right so if she says crabs should do this you must do that and she couldn't so it's like who are you to to explain what you can't do or suggest what you can't do next up is sanjay um yeah thank you so i just want to make a comment um following up with what uh you know, we're talking about complaining versus critiquing. And I think um, critiquing always has uh, a reason given and that reason may take the form of data. Um, so it's a rational um, explanation of what um, the person found uh, to be problematic. Whereas complaint um, rarely has that, complaint doesn't have any kind of reasoning in, involved mm -hmm. in, and that's usually because it is, it is emotionally driven. Um, another part that I think is important when we're talking about uh, critique or complaint, I think it's it's always good, and this is something I try to do always, is is if I'm giving a critique to someone, I try to suggest um, possible ways to improve, because that I find mm -hmm. is um, it helps them, and it, it also emphasizes to them that the goal that we all share is for um, self improvement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It makes me think of there's actually a uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the book um, from Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. And he says, um, I forget there, there's a principle early on in the book about something with critiquing. And he says, if you want to critique somebody, that's totally fine. Um, I don't remember like the, the example he used, uh, like this, the phrase or the summary of the chapter title, whatever it was. But um, he says you should start with like praise. So it's like if you see uh, somebody in your job who's doing a very terrible job at like this particular department, you should start with like something they are doing good. Like even if it's trivial, it's like, uh, hey, you're very punctual. You've been on work. You've been uh, at, at on time to work every single morning for the past whatever. Every single time I've seen you, you're always the first in the office. But let's talk about your quota. You know what I mean? It's like so you have to make a certain segue into that. I think that's more effective. I've actually tried that as an experiment before in my past with like trying to, um, I guess, suggest alternatives for other people's behavior. It's like you don't want to just come out the gate with like, hey, like this is my critique of what you're doing. I think you should be because even though it's well intentioned, of course, as you said, we all have a mutual desire for, for personal growth or we might impose that desire onto other people or project it or impose it or something um they might not like have the same they might not be as like re um receptive to that you know what i mean so it's like they might look at it as an attack or they might get insecure about it if they're if their identity is founded upon it um, or if they haven't analyzed that or if it's an area of their life they're insecure about whatever it happens to be so i've actually seen that experiment work um several times you try to start with like you open with okay here's something that i like about what you've been doing and now, like maybe if you wanted to 
you know, grow a little bit further in this particular realm, here's my critique with some data, of course, or alternatives. I want to add a story, John, from Fountainhead on critiquing. Um, so yeah, Howard Roth, yeah. who is the um, who is the protagonist, goes to uh, his favorite art, uh, architect, uh, Henry Cameron, for looking for a job, and the first couple they just exchange a few words. So firstly, he says, "I've been fired. You know, I've been I've been dismissed from my school," and Henry Cam Cameron asks him why. And he just takes all his drawings. He says, this is why, and puts the drawings on the table. Now that is basically saying that this is what matters. You know, this is, this is what I am, this is what matters. And then Henry Cameron starts to look at the drawings one by one and he just critiques them. He says, what, what in the world are you doing here? And then goes to the next one. So for hours, he goes through the drawings, just critiquing them brutally. But, you know, and at the end of it, you know, Howard Rock notices as, as he's going along is that he's looking at drawings as if these were how these were these houses are being built and he's giving feedback on that. And at the end of these several hours of critiquing of drawings, he says, um, okay, you're hired, come back tomorrow and leave the drawings here. So it's just, just pure critique, but both the parties understand that it is in the context of building something. So it's like, it's the difference between active versus passive. Most people who complained, they are like people watching TV. They're, they're, they are living life as if they're watching TV and they're just kind of passively passing their emotions. Whereas when you're doing critiquing like this, you're actually building something. And it is in the service of the building that you're providing the negative feedback so you can build better. Uh, John, any any thoughts? I I like that analogy. It's it's passive. Like if you, if you're watching TV, it's you're not a participant. You have no contribution to the outcome. Um, you're as you're a pure spectator, right? You have no. There's no denominator. There's no input you can do to change the outcome. Um, and I think it's very detrimental. I think it's possible to do that with your own life. I think it's possible to be a spectator of your own life and watch life happen to you instead of for you. Um, so that's the distinction I always try to make myself. Life is happening for you, not to you. Things don't happen to you, they happen for you. Um, I, I like that analogy of watching TV, very passive. You have, yeah, you have no, no outcome, no, no con contribution over the outcome. I like that. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, Jean, Laura, and Jyoti. Uh, Jean, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I want to give a uh, opposite Examples, uh, for example, gymnastic coach. It's kind of interesting. Actually, I learned a lot of gymnastic coach. They cannot do the things the athletes do, but they can be a really good coach. So, which is quite interesting. Like they can teach something they cannot do, but that's actually pretty common nowadays because they have, they know this technique, but they cannot physically do themselves because they're not in that physical Mo, you know, like a uh, condition like the athletes are. So that's what my opposite example I want to show. But uh, I also agree, you know, like for kids education is very important to, to do what you say, kids observe better your behavior than what you t tell them. They actually, they don't really listen. They actually observe, you know, so that's actually work pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, I do see. I do see that. I mean, this could this could be extended to like include. Oh, only take advice from people who have what you want or can do what you want to do. You know, within reason, of course. Like, there's no absolutes in terms of like any any philosophy, any this, any that. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, but in, in most cases, though, I feel like coaches have, uh, in most cases, played at that level, like when they were younger, right? Of course, you know what I mean. Or, or they, they they've done something very similar, or they were in a very, I guess, close proximity to people who have done profoundly uh, influential things with their uh, physiology and, and, and inspirational um, 
use of like their fit, fitness goals, for example. Um, so yeah, there could be exceptions. You know what I mean? Maybe there are coaches who have not, who've never played the sport. Maybe they just been around it their entire life. Um, but they're, they can kind of get secondhand experience or secondhand conclusions from being around enough exposure to people at that level, you could say. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, Laura. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say something that my daughter, every time I try and critique something, she says I'm complaining. Okay. So where does that fit? John, go ahead. Where does that fit? Um, that I mean, fit? that could be... I could just be 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 typical uh, rebelliousness of, of, of children. But, I think. You know what I mean? Like, she's not a very, kid anymore, John. She's uh -huh. she's an adult. Oh, 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 oh. She's oh, a thirty-year-old. I don't know. I don't. Okay. Uh, the, no. uh, uh, what what I would say is that the same thing that applies to person who is critiquing versus complaining applies to the person who is receiving the complaining or critiquing. See, if you are committed to your own growth. And if you are willing to look at your mistakes, then you take a critique as a critique. If you are committed not to make any changes in your life, no matter how good a critique you're getting about what you're doing, you hear only the complaining. And so that I think it applies from both sides, this complaining versus uh, critiquing. Uh, next up is uh, Jyoti. Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, great presentation. Uh, in my opinion, critiquing can be very dangerous. If, if the critiquer does not know, he has not assessed the situation uh, with the person to whom he's critiquing, because sometimes you are dealing with a person who has limited abilities. He just can't do the, the best that you are expecting him to do because of the limitations. I'm talking about the children in the school who have uh, who are special education children. If they are compared with the regular education children who have uh, quote unquote the normal abilities, it, the critique can become very dangerous to these special education children because they are being compared with the regular education children. So one has to have a knowledge before critiquing. One has to be very sensitive about the temperamental makeup of the person who you are critiquing. And there are, have, the person has to go around uh, critiquing. In, even in my own family, even though they are regular people, I had to be very careful with my words. So any opinion about that? Yeah, I mean, you're right in, in, in the conclusion that you have to analyze like an individual's personal temperamental makeup and idiosyncrasies and like the constituents of their character, uh, what their goals might be. Obviously, like you said, their talents, their abilities, their capacities or capabilities, etc. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't I don't I, I get where you're going with that example. But I don't think that's like a, a relevant thing in, in today's society. I don't think like people are held at, at an equivalent standard across the board, like across any domain or any like. I guess, compartmentalization of life. Um, so maybe maybe a good proposition can be like the more individual you make the critique, the better, right? So it's like, I can critique, it'll be hard for me to objectively critique a group of people at once, right? So like, oh, all of you should X, Y, Z. That's very hard to do. Where if I, if I look at somebody and assuming, I kind of actually want to tie uh, Mark's question into this answer. I, it was a really good question uh, for those who didn't get a chance to read it. Mark said, is it okay to, um, well, I, I don't have the chat up. It's like, is it okay to uh, critique without asking? Oh yeah. Is it okay to provide a critique without being asked for one? Very good question. Personally, I think if your intention is in the correct place um, and it's not projection, I think it is okay. So in terms of like this example of the mother crab, I don't know that that would be proper criticism because that was displacement, that was projection. That was an insecurity or an inadequacy that the mother had and she's projecting onto someone else. If I say like, oh, you should do this, you should get financially independent, you should get in shape, whatever. And it's coming from a place of insecurity or a place of lack or a place of unwillingness to deal with my reality, then I don't think that's okay. But if it's coming from a place of like pure, purely altruistic um, motives, like I, I understand this person, I, I have a relationship with this person, I want them to do better, or it would greatly interest them to do better in a particular domain of competence. And then I provide my critique based off like objective data. I understand that person. I know we both know they're capable of more 
and they're not living up to their potential. And it's, I think personally, it's okay for me to critique them at that point. I think it's contingent upon your intention with that. Um, and I think maybe that could be a, a constructive conclusion here is like the more individual you make the critique, the more effective it can be, right? Because you understand that person, there's a little bit of context, you have an understanding of their talents, their abilities, uh, maybe their goals, maybe their intentions, because like I can say, oh, you're, you know, you're in decent shape, but you should go get a six pack. You should go run a marathon. You should go do this. And it's like, maybe that's not congruent with their goals, but it's like, at that point, it's me projecting my values of fitness and health onto that person. So it's like, maybe that's a little bit uncalled for. Um, but if their ideals are in mind, or if you have like an accountability relationship with them and they, and they tell you, I want to earn this income by the end of the year, I want to have a, a more rich dynamic social life by the end of this year. I want to, you know, do these things by the end of the year. And then you critique along those guidelines. I think it's perfectly uh, called for. Uh, next up is Paul. Yeah, thanks. Um, a number of things go through my mind. I'll try to just go back to what I was thinking though. First, um, regarding the great point that sometimes people who haven't done it can do it. I think sometimes those people are doing everything through the mind. They can tell that an athlete has a mental block and they get the athlete through that block. Just a quick point on that, if you have any comment on that. But more, another thing about this fable, um, I, I think the greatest failure of the mother is to not recognize the limitations of her child, similar to what we've talking about. But my question is, would you possibly interpret the fable that she didn't know her own limitations as opposed to that she was shamed by it. Just your comments on that. Um, I personally, I mean, those, those are really good insights. Personally, I think like I take a more, I guess, I don't know, contemptuous attitude toward the mother crab in this example in particular. Like that's kind of how I'm looking at this. Um, because she's gone throughout her entire life, she should have at least tried to um, implement this philosophy of like, oh, crabs should walk forward. Like you've spent your entire life with this belief and you've never tried it. That's hypocrisy in my eyes, right? It's like that you haven't implemented what you've learned. You have no initiative. You haven't taken action on your beliefs um, and therefore they are hollow, right? And it's like, I think the, the concluding statement in, in, the, in the like overarching simple analysis of it is from Aesop, do not tell others how to act unless you can set a good example. That's a powerful line, very, very powerful line. Uh, thanks. Uh, next up, uh, great point, Paul, though. I mean, I really like, like the point. It's like, I think, I mean, I, I like the point that, you know, basically there are people who deny their own identity as a crap. Uh, so they have denied that identity in themselves and in others. And so their opinions are completely connect, disconnected from, from reality. Um, so next up is Jeff, Mark, and Donna. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, just a second. Jeff, are you there? Okay, uh, Paul, uh, Mark, you're next. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah, kind of touched on most of what I was going to say. Actually, John, that was what I was going to talk about, the fable. To me, the primary uh, message of that fable is the mother is not like a critique or a complaint. She's actually telling her son how to behave, but she can't set the example. As you said, you, you actually said it the, exactly the way I, I, I imagined it. Um, so I think that's something that you should take away from it. If you are going to offer a critique, where is that critique coming from? Is it coming from a position of knowledge and experience or is it some opinion that really isn't based on anything at all? You know, so can you be that good example? And if not, you need to find out why first. And as to the other point about when you one's offering a critique, like I find it goes down much better if the other person asked for the feedback rather than just going and giving it to them. Um, if you are going to do that, then I think we have to get into like strategies because I, I think most people are not always going to be open minded if you just walk up to them and say, so, yeah, I've got some opinions about your life and how you're behaving. I'd like to share them with you right now. I don't think that goes down too well. So I was wondering whether you had any thoughts about how to approach people, because I find 
like asking them questions is a good way into a conversation about this, like confirming what their intention actually was with what they did. Because like if I'm coming at it, if I've misunderstood what their what they believe their goals and intentions are, my quote unquote advice could be completely worthless and actually counterproductive. I wonder what you might think about that. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's what I was going to conclude with, um, and that's in the first analysis, which is like you have to maybe have a a I don't know understanding of their goals or their intentions. Like, are they doing their I don't know. Let's say it's for example, just in the practical terms. For an example, let's use fitness or something. Um, are they are they living their current lifestyle because their goal is comfort or their goal is like I don't know. It's hedonistic uh, driven. Um, or it's just pleasure, or it's like just getting by, or it's like just having a baseline level of health so I can focus on my work or focus on other priorities in my life, like whatever their, their value structure is, hierarchy, I'm not going to impose mine upon them, of course. Um, that's very different than me. Like oh, if, if they operate with that, whereas if like I come in and it's like health is like up on the very, very high in my hierarchy of values. And if I say, hey, like I look around, like this is how you live. This is crazy. Like you need to do this. You need to do this. Like you need, you should do this. You should do that that's completely discorded, right? Because that's not a prime goal in their life, right? So I think an understanding of their intentions, of their motives, of their goals um, can be, it's, it's crucial. That, that is imperative to, to have before you even critique something. Um, if they have like a lifelong desire or intention of growth, then they should be welcoming up all criticism, um, assuming it's, it's constructive and valid and like and rationality driven, right? So like, I, I don't know, I, I tend to, always encourage um, like people who disagree with me, always people who would want to provide me uh, critiques. I've listened to some complaints before. Um, and I, when I'm dealing with complaints, I mostly realize it's projection. If it's just like emotional, like a tirade or something, I, I don't really react. I try not to react a lot. Uh, but if it's critique, if there's valid points, sometimes they might like um, hit something, hit a nerve that might be, I might get a little bit defensive, but I won't react in that moment. I'm like, okay, I need to think about that. Cause like, that's just, that made, that had a elicit, it elicited a little bit of emotion. Um, but this is all predicated on my value of like continual growth, continual improvement in all realms of my life. Therefore I should be welcoming of criticism. So if somebody just walk up to me and said, Hey, here, as you, the example you provided, Hey, here's my opinion on what you're doing. You know what I mean? I'll analyze and I'll say, okay, where is that person coming from? You know what I mean? From what I understand of that person, of course, but um, it's all, I think it's all comes down to your intention and the person and the recipient's intention as well, their goals, their motives, their ideals. Next up is Jeff, Donna and Maxine. Jeff, go ahead. Hey, John. So um, among the things that I do is uh, work with teams. Um, both of, of emerging leaders in the South Bronx to graduate students at NYU to um, staff of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And one of the ground rules that we have found useful to establish that is directly related to what you're sharing here is uh, respecting that people have a conversation with themselves and then that they have a conversation with us and each other as a team. And so we ask people to have the conversation with themselves, first of all, that the cost of noticing or presenting a problem, and I've written it here in the, in the chat, is sharing your best ideas for solving it. Your ideas don't need to be perfect. In fact, you must assume they're not. They just need to be your best ideas at the moment. And after sharing them, be prepared to ask a question. Possibly, I wonder if, I wonder how we could, I wonder what it would take to. Um, that little script turns out to be to uh, get us in our conversation individually with ourselves, whether we tell anybody else about it or not, and very practical and useful for uh, noticing problems and presenting them and sharing them uh, with each other in the context of a, of a team. And I'm wondering uh, what you think about that, if you have any feedback or input to that. That's a really interesting point. I like the phrases that you've used. Um, if you if you phrase it like a question, I don't know, specifically use the word we, right? You didn't say you. You didn't say here's what you should. It's like we. It's like a mutual approach, right? And this made me think of a, I don't know like what teacher or like coach, whatever, uh, espouse this. But in terms of like if people have a predicament in their relationship with their partner, it's not like 
me versus you or me versus my partner, like my stance versus their stance. Um, it should be the, the relationship versus the problem, right? That's a very different way of reframing the issue. It's not like the, the husband versus the wife. It's the husband and the wife versus the issue, right? So it's like to, to put it in that, in that, in that way, in, in other dynamics, like the, the company, the organization, the floor, the department, the whole company, whatever it happens to be, to, to have it us versus the problem, those questions are imperative to put it in that perspective. It's like, what can we do? You get the other person in a creative state. You're asking them a question. Their brain wants to answer the question, right? Instead of saying, you should do this, or, or like a, a, a little bit better is we should do this, a little bit better, but even better is like, what should we do? Or what if we did this? It's a question. You put a question mark at that, their brain, they, they're primed to respond to that, right? So it's like they had their idea. You, you, you quote unquote, attacked it, not in a deleterious way, but you provided an alternative in the form of a question. So it's like, hey, I'm on your side here. What can we do to make this better? It's like we, you're using the word we instead of you, instead of projecting, um, and then phrasing it in a question, they're going to, I guess, deviate away from their initial point, which may not have been as constructive as the final point would be. They're going to deviate away when they start answering questions because they're going to move here, move here, try out hypotheses in their head, try out uh, hypotheses in the real world, experiments, get better, get better. But I think it's a really good way to, to phrase that. It's like us versus the problem, not me versus you. Next up, it, is, it even okay. offers a reply sometimes where people say, well, I think the question, I think the problem is this. And my idea for solving that problem is this. I wonder what you all mm -hmm. think of that. Just to give you a sense yeah, of where yeah, it generally thing, yeah. goes. Sorry yeah. for the done. No problem. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, fine. Jeff. Uh, next up is Donna followed by Maxine. Building, yes, Donna, go ahead. Building off of what Mark said earlier about experience, could you see examples where bad behavior could be an example of don't do what I do, do this instead? I mean, yeah, it can be, but I think it's a, it's a negative approach. I, I personally would think people learn best by positive example. Um, I've, I've always hated like, I mean, hate's a strong word, of course, but I've always disliked when people say like, um, I don't know, they're coaching someone or like they're, they're a parent or something. Do as I say, not as I do. I, I've always hated that phrase, um, probably because of this principle here. What we're talking about is like practice what you preach. It's like if somebody says do as I say, not as I do, like that's basically the, this, this mother crab here. It's like you should do this, but I can't even do it myself. Um, or maybe it's not even possible. Right. In the crab's case. I think it's very, very hollow, very dangerous to, to adhere to those guidelines. Um, but I mean, it, it could work maybe construct, but I think long-term a more effective and like um, useful approach and reliable approach would be like positive example. Like do, do as I do, you know what I mean? If you're trying to lead somebody. Next up is Maxine. Uh. I don't know how to use this advice because um, no one wants advice. Uh, it, <laughs> you can't give anyone, and, and no one will ask for a criticism, and, and they will not want any advice. Um, I'll give you an example. <laughs> Uh, if I would try to give any of my family advice, uh, my son said, we listened to your advice for years and now it's time to sit back and cheer. So how do you give that kind of person advice? You can't. Um, but, and you can't say, well, do what I do because they don't want to, even if your advice is wonderful, no one wants to do what you do. So I have to work it around another way. And I have to say, um, I really need help with a certain problem. And do you think you could help me? And when they start to try to help you, that's a good time for them to catch on to what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and uh, you can't say to them, um, uh, if, 
you can't, you, it, it works best if you say to them, you're going to hate this. And they'll say, oh, I think I like that. And that's how I get them to do my advice because it's an impossibility. They're not going to ask for it. I mean, in any situation, and this is not only family, this is friends. They do not want your advice. They want you to mirror what they say. And sometimes what they say is outrageous and you certainly do not want to mirror it. But if you want them to speak to you again, you have to mirror what they say and somehow come around in a circle to give them advice. Yeah, really interesting point. I mean, I've noticed this in, in people, even in myself sometimes, where like, when you receive advice, I think the source is a obviously the source matters like where it's coming from right so people tend to um well can tend to like look at advice differently if it's coming from a stranger than if it's coming from somebody they deeply know right or even if it's coming from themselves like if i know something to be true and i'm neglecting it and then i eventually see it i don't know in one of my social media news feeds i'm like oh my god i i needed this today like you see a lot of people say that i needed this today like it's not like you've never heard that advice in your life right it's not like it's not this new groundbreaking like influential data it's like you it's like these cliche phrases people are like oh my god this is exactly what i needed it's the fact that it's outside of you and you see it you have a different relationship with that source you don't know the source that it came from it could be a complete stranger it could be like an associate or an acquaintance on social media somebody who doesn't know you very well you don't know them very well but you're going to have a different relationship with the quote unquote advice that they're sharing on, on their on their page or whatever it happens to be. So I think obviously the source matters, as you're saying, like there's there are different dynamics going on with family members, et cetera. Um, and this goes back kind of to, to Mark's statement. Uh, Mark's question is like, is it okay to just like spew out criticism of the world? You know what I mean? And it's like, the, obviously source matters, uh, the recipient matters, what their intention is matters, what their goal is matters, your understanding of the recipient matters uh, as well. So there, there's a lot of context there. All right, let's take the last two questions. Uh, we are we have very little time, so keep the questions short and sweet. It's going to be uh, Laura followed by Cheryl. Laura, go ahead. I think this goes back a bit, but usually if somebody comes to me with a problem or whatever, I'll have them talk to me about it and then I'll um, sort of respond by ask, to, saying, um, let me make sure I heard you and I repeat what I think they said, and it gives them room to say whether I got it right or not. And that leads us into the ability to have, you know, points of um, agreement, disagreement, whatever, a place where it could be critiqued or look for solutions or something. And I found that kind of works um, pretty well. Excellent point, Laura. Uh, John, you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I think that just relates to, it makes me think of what I was just talking about with like the example of social media. Like if I see something in, in the advice I need, but just in different words or from a different source, I have a different relationship with it. You know what I mean? It's like, I do that on, um, I do that on, on, on calls as well. Um, like for, for business stuff and the side that I do, um, i I was having a discussion with somebody and he, he wanted to improve like these certain things of his life. And I'm like, oh, I'm asking him like, what are, what are your values? Like what are the four, I guess, areas of your life that you would, you would need to improve the most or three or something. And then he said these three things that I like, I rephrased it in my words and then him hearing it, he's like, no way, actually this, you know what I mean? So it's like, he, he, he said something and then I took it and I rephrased it for him or like I externalized it, you could say, or displaced it for him. And then he's looking at it more objectively and he's saying, uh, no, this, that, that, that's a little bit different. I can refine that a little bit. So that's a really interesting point and very valid as well. Okay, last question is from Cheryl. Cheryl, go ahead. Um, I think you already answered this, John, but um, I was, not maybe considering the recipient, because I was thinking about an interaction I had with a neighbor who had a three-legged dog. And when I first saw the three-legged dog, I was very excited. And I got a few, like I normally approach a dog from a few feet away and entice the dog to come toward me by going, come here, come here, come here, and getting the dog a little bit excited so that I know whether or not it wants to approach me. 
And when I did that to this woman's dog, she thought I was being mean to it because it had three legs and it was walking a little awkwardly, a little slowly. And she thought I was teasing the dog because it couldn't move very fast. And she kind of scolded me that I was teasing her dog. And I said, well, I just thought the dog could go faster. Um, I, I wasn't intentionally teasing the dog. I was trying to just get it excited to see how fast it could move because I think um, bicycles move faster than tricycles and they move faster than quads. So I kind of thought the dog could go faster. And, but at any rate, I think your, to your point, I wasn't considering the recipient who was making accommodations for her dog um, and her thinking that I was being mean. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's a that's a funny, funny line of logic too. Bikes are faster than tricycles. That's funny. Um, yeah, the recipient obviously is important to consider in this in this situation. Like there can be examples where like you could have a relationship with somebody, you could know them, you could know their goals, you know they want to grow, and you provide them criticism, but they just take offense to it. Maybe they're extremely defensive. They're really insecure. Um, they said something. They said a goal that's. They said to you a goal that was, uh, I don't know, maybe it was impulsive in the moment. They don't really believe they could do that or whatever happens to be. Um, and they might get really, really defensive over it or they might change their mind. So it's definitely important to have that in mind at all times as well, like the, the recipient, yeah. All right, so that brings us to the end of Q&A. Um, so we're going to, there are going to be two differences before um, we, we're going to do things uh, differently in two different ways. So firstly, I'm going to experiment with uh, breakout rooms with smaller number of people. So there are going to be between three to four people in each breakout room. Um, and we're going to do this for about 20 minutes. And let me know if, uh, and afterwards, let me know if smaller breakout room works better for this kind of discussion than bigger uh, breakout room. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, after we come back, instead of doing takeaways, we're going to say, okay, what's the most important question that you would like to raise? And I'm not going to ask, uh, you know, call on everybody, but anybody who has a question that you, you would like to put on the table, you can go ahead and put the question on the table. After everybody has put the questions on the table, then, you know, John and I will pick a few of them to, to discuss at that point. All right. So those are the two different things. So what are we doing in the breakout rooms, Sean? So we have three questions for today's discussion to facilitate the uh, breakout groups. The first question, I think it's not that simple to answer. Why is it easier to spot flaws in others than in ourselves? Why is it easy for us to critique the world versus critiquing ourselves? Second question is, uh, it, it's, it's questioning my narrative, is do people really learn best by example? I think it's the most effective approach. Um, if you disagree, why or why not? And third, the third question, I've already espoused my, my belief, uh, but in your words, what is the difference between critiquing versus complaining? All right, so with that, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is that we are going for only questions, you know, big questions that you thought of. Um, so if you have any questions, then just go ahead and type exclamation mark and um, we will come to it. So what, so anybody with questions? Okay, John, you have a question, go ahead. I don't know if I'm supposed to ask a question because apparently <laughs> I'm purportedly supposed to answer it. You, but, you, any, um, anybody who is quick on the draw gets it. So John, it's yours, okay, go ahead. That's fair. Um, if I'm receiving criticism, if I'm receiving advice from somebody, how can I tell if it's objectively useful or it's projection from something they're dealing with in their life. Excellent. So John, you have to keep track of all, you have to keep track of all the questions um, and then we mm -hmm. will have to pick something. So I'm gonna have you keep uh, track of the questions. Uh, so it's gonna be Joe followed okay. by Gene. Joe, what's your question? Um, so I'm still just thinking this out, but do you need to accept yourself in order to critique somebody efficiently or fairly? So. Excellent. Um, next up is Jean. Jean, what's your question? Um, 
my question is like, I think only the good friends really give you constructive criticism. Most people will not because they don't want to offend you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, I personally think if people give you unsolicited advice, you really have a good intention. Either What's useful. your question? What's your question? <laughs> so uh, the question is, how can you judge the people's intention to give you advice? Okay. <laughs> advice. Excellent. Next up is uh, Deborah followed by Paul. Deborah, go ahead. Okay. I was thinking like, and this kind of pertains to the first question, can people internalize something they haven't directly tried or experienced themselves? So concern, concerning like learning by example, like just watching something, if you haven't actually tried it yet, so can you internalize it? Okay, uh, Paul. Yeah, uh, I don't have a question. Answer for John, data. Always ask no, 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 no answers, Paul. No answers, just okay, questions. There was question. Okay. Questions are far more valuable. Okay, the question is, how do you want, uh, if people don't want to listen, how do you want to go in the, uh, any conversation or any um, uh, any, uh, any critique if they don't want to listen, listen to crit criticism? Okay, thank you. Um, Laura, what's your question? Uh, do you want me to read it out? Okay, uh, Laura's question is, what gives us the right to critique someone? All right. Let me see. All right. Um, okay. Um, I want to add the question of, because we've been talking about us critiquing or complaining about other people. I think all kinds of issues apply to accepting of criticism. You know, how, how do you, how do you take criticism? So I've, I have questions about, you know, what's the right approach to accepting quote unquote complaining or criticism? What's, what's the right approach for that? So I'll put that on the table. Let me see anybody else. No, that's it. That's it. Um, so give me just a second. Okay, I'm just going through. So it looks like, you know, smaller rooms work, four to five people. Some people are saying four is good. Uh, three to four is good. Four to five, five to six. Okay, so it looks like, so I'm, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to keep experimenting with, with between, you know, three to six people. And as over time, I'll we'll collect more data. I'm doing this for multiple meetups. And only after doing this for about a week or so, we'll, we'll come up with a system. But for now, I'm just going to keep varying um, and keep getting feedback. And then I'll do kind of bigger surveys, uh, more systematic surveys, um, you know, in, in Zoom to do that. All right. Um, so, John, what questions do you think we should take up? I think the ones that elicit most exploration can be how can we judge someone's intention when they're giving us advice? And that's kind of tied into uh, to, to mine, which is like how, how to tell what's valid or what's projection. Uh, the other one, I think it's, it's very fruitful. We haven't really explored um, yet was, was yours. What's the right approach to being a recipient for either complaints or, or, criti or criticism? Okay, so how, about we, how about we start with the accepting of criticism? Um, and now we can, everybody can give their own answers. I mean, for me, it's actually exactly opposite. Like people have talked about how difficult it is to give people to criticism. They don't like criticism. I actually like criticism a lot. You know, I really, really appreciate criticism. Um, and what, what that does is that it's basically somebody is putting, you know, their relationship with you on the line to tell you something. So I, I really appreciate that. And actually the best thing is some of the best friends I have. Um, and I think I agree with uh, Gene that a person needs to know something about you and then they can give you, it's not necessary, but a, if a person knows something about you, they can give you a far more targeted criticism, which actually fits into both your goals, your nature and the problem all together. Um, so I, really appreciate my friends who know me very well, really care about me and are very direct. Uh, they have their own styles. You know, some people do it very nicely. Some people do it very abruptly, but in either case, I may be upset about it during that time for a few seconds, 
uh, it's very much possible uh, if, if because some people are you know don't have tact or anything like that some people are extremely good at it but that that i would if i do i ignore because the value of actually getting self correction you know that feedback that is so cheap way of fixing things because otherwise you're going to spend your life doing that and that cost is just horrendous so getting people's feedback right mean, so for me it's like uh, that and then of course um, there are kind of patterns of tendencies that you have to have i think um, ray dalio has a very good system of uh, you know believability so there are people whose believability varies depending on subject that they are talking about i certainly take that into account i also never lose sight of the fact that i know who i am i know what i'm trying to do so i have to and the other person may not necessarily know that so i have to factor that too so there is a lot of factoring that i have to do i have to also do a lot of fact checking to see whether actually they are they have a valid point or not many times they don't have a valid point um but i you know i i welcome all all criticism uh it's it's such a cheap way of uh, making improvements uh john what about you um can you can you hear me fine yes uh john what i have to do is i have to mute you occasionally okay my connection uh, go ahead yeah 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 no right now like my video is a little bit choppy for everybody else i actually broke out of the breakout room for some reason i don't know if i'm something's up with my wi-fi but anyways if i disconnect that's the reason um i agree with that like i've i've been very very welcoming of criticism um as i mentioned in the, in the main presentation as well i've been the recipient of complaints as well a lot um and of course the 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 monkey brain will get defensive get reactive get emotional in those situations um but i've you could say trained myself to be like okay i'll kind of try to take that i'll be like dismissive maybe superficially in the moment but then like i'll go home later and i'll actually think about what they said why did they say it why did they feel the need to say it in the manner that they did is there truth behind it like i'll gauge their believability as you can as you'll say are they projecting do they know me do they know that realm of my life etc um i'll try to do my best to actually analyze it and take that criticism and be like okay if i superimpose this over my life if i actually made these implementations does my life look better are they right are they constructive in that should i implement this uh, but in the moment you know i try to I try to listen i try to find the meaning behind it i try to find a reason the intention you can say um, but i do notice patterns the only complaints i've got uh, like emotional reactions are from people who don't know me at all like random comments online or something like that um, and i i hold no merit in those i hold no no um there's, they're not valid at all um and then obviously i hold I, there is a there is a value structure in terms of like how much i will take um a critique to heart based on how much somebody knows me how much i know them etc so yeah Excellent. So next up is going to be Sanjay, uh, Cheryl, Jeff, and Joe. Sanjay, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, I completely agree with what you both um, said. I also prefer it, and I, I don't want to say enjoy, but I I, I would definitely want um, criticism. I, I um, welcome it, criticism and and uh, complaints. And I think it's important, you know, as as both of you said, it's important to look at. Um, how it's said, who is saying it, how well they know you. Um, also, it's important to look at what part of our behavior it's, it's addressing. If it's part of our behavior that is um, very easy to see versus something that is more subtle and, and it may be um, harder for someone else to assess, um, that's important. Also, um, you know, the, the way that that other person thinks is important, whether they, um, you know, how they present the critique or, or complaint, whether it's just a something that's said, or if they actually give specific examples, if they if they thought about it, um, these are all important. One thing that I think that um, even even after all of that, no matter what anyone says, it, you know, anytime that someone gives gives criticism or complaint to me, I always take it at heart. I, I always try, try to listen to it and try to interpret as if. You know, um, they're saying it to so to not to me, but to someone else. I take it at face value and I try to interpret. I try to put myself in their own shoes, or I try to put it into um, a different perspective and and assume that it's true. Assume what they said is true, and then try to work backwards from that to see, um, you know, if it applies. If I start to see similar behaviors that I see in myself, 
based on what a person in that situation would do. So I try to assume that they're right, um, but also I, I look at um, how well they understand me in the situation. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, next up is Cheryl. Cheryl, go ahead. Um, I think just to piggyback on what Sanjay just said that rang true was about assuming what people say as criticism is true. I think maybe that's why I have a hard time when I'm hearing criticism, not taking it to heart and not just kind of feeling a little bit demoralized, like um, that it's hurtful uh, in some way. And I, I actually don't think that I ever really get over it unless I hear that same sort of criticism in kind of a funny way where I can make, where I can say, oh yeah, I did do that and laugh at myself. Because I think when somebody frames that same perception or that same activity or that same reaction in like a funny way, I feel like it's okay to laugh at myself that, um, I, that I did that. And maybe I didn't, when I did it, I didn't do it in a funny way, but it's funny in that it's kind of a quirkiness that other people also have. So it makes me feel like, oh, I'm okay, because that's just a funny little quirk and I can settle it with myself. Instead of thinking there's something really drastically wrong with me that, um, that I have to somehow like adjust as like a character flaw. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Jeff, Joe, Jean, and Deborah. Jeff, go ahead. So um, I put this in the, the chat as well. I think this, this idea of asking questions is really important. Um, that, you know, for each of us, it's really useful to have, a, to be clear regarding what our intentions are and to try to align our actions which are with our words, which is really the definition of integrity and, and to, to be vulnerable when we're not uh, really aligning our actions with our words or our values. Um, I have found it really useful to, um, when, I'm, when I'm talking with folks to ask, to, to, to ask them, what questions do you think I should be asking myself? Um, what question you know, should I be asking you? And even what question would you like to be asked? Um, I use those in interviewing people for jobs and, and, and in a lot of different settings and have found them all really useful in eliciting constructive criticism and, uh, and people telling the truth and shaming the devil. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Joe? Um, so just really quickly, uh, I, you know, when you had mentioned the idea of um, how you, your friends that are critique you that, you know, that I think that's a really important point is that some of our greatest friendships are, are friendships of virtue are when somebody, you know, uh, critiques us and, and we, ex and still accepts us who we are. But I think critical in this process is the idea of how we accept that criticism will ultimately result in how whether we end up to be critical of somebody or whether we end up to be um, uh, complaining about another individual because if we don't like ourselves then we'll more than likely see the negative parts of everybody else but if we're able to accept that criticism and accept ourselves it kind of creates a certain amount of space to honestly critique not only ourselves but other people and so I think that that's it's a it's a it's an important feedback loop that we're 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 uh, talking about here as well. So that's all I wanted to add. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I mean, one small comment I would make is that this kind of accepting criticism and this kind of attitude about kind of being open to it presumes that you're trying to improve, and you're saying that improve actually improvement, actual improvement is what you are after, not trying to seem to be good to yourself or to others. That really doesn't matter. You're actually trying to be good, actually trying to improve. Uh, and that's a case, it's, it's all positive. Uh, Jean, what do you think about accepting criticism? Yeah, actually I think um, the friends who really know you can give you a very constructive, constructive criticism, really valuable. Actually I have a, I had a friend like a while ago, even after years, I think about 
what he said. Oh, like, oh my God, he said it's so right. Actually, I think he's such a valuable friend. You know, so a lot of people, they don't have that insight. That's why I really, but it's very hard to find a friend who actually know, understand it, and actually sometimes in a higher level than you. So they can really see what's the problem you have. So it's very rare. Uh, I want to share another thing is like, recently I got criticism from my, uh, my husband and my mom because how I deal with my client, because I got very emotional. <laughs> so, you know, like yeah. they have a lot of experience, but the client, sometimes you give them advice, they don't listen. And the reason I learned, you know, like we have to treat the friend, the client like our kids because they gave them advice, but they have, they still have to learn with their own mistakes. You tell them this is the right way to do it, but they still want to go the wrong way. So mm -hmm. we have to be patient, let them learn with their time or money. So they will learn by themselves. But anyway, uh, so learn that. Uh, thank the you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, I, I want to make one point also, and this is what I found you know, thanks to uh, the meetups I've been doing in New York and the meetups over here. Uh, yes, a person who knows you well can give you criticism, but a person who does not know you well can actually give you some out of the box criticism that you would never thought of, uh, that you would never have thought of because by your nature, your friends whom you know are kind of selected based on things that you value, things that you know, there is a common knowledge, there is a common value, and they can give you criticism with respect to that. Now, but what I found is that being open to people as such and actually hearing them, sometimes I hear things which I would never have heard before. And the thing is that they do not have the full background, but just by being who they are, because they're so different, they can actually point out something that you can improve that you would never in a million years have gotten from your friends. So I, I'm also a big fan of kind of being open to listening. And it doesn't have to, they actually don't have to give you the criticism. You can actually compare and say, hey, wait a minute, they're doing something there. I don't do that. What's the deal with that? Is that something that I should look into or not? So it's like being observant um, also. All right, uh, next up is Deborah, followed by John. I, I don't take criticism well. <laughs> I know that about myself. Um, but I was thinking that um, I think I take it better or maybe I put more stock in it if I feel like there's an emotional aspect to it. Like if I, have hurt somebody or if there's a possibility that I could hurt somebody by something that I've done or something that I've said, I feel like that's something I will consider. And I can try to be a little, even if it does like offend me or I'm um, sensitive to it, I can try to be at least at some point a little more objective about it. And I think what Chachi said about being demoralized when you hear that is a really good word for like a feeling that at least I feel like um, that follows criticism. So. I also thought, and this goes along with what other people were saying, if I feel like it's coming from someone who kind of accepts me overall um, and also has demonstrated that they like attributes about me, I feel like I know that they care about me. So it isn't just like a random thing where they're trying to hurt me. And I feel like maybe there's more of like a balance there so I can take it that way as opposed to just like, oh, somebody's being analytical and they have some criticism. I'm like, is that necessary to say? I feel like if there's an emotional aspect, I, I guess I take it better or take it more seriously. Thank you, Deborah. Um, John. Yes, um, you actually took half of my, my first point, which is like, they don't people don't necessarily have to implicitly know you. Um, I've got a lot of good feedback. I've had a lot of very good um, critiques and discussions and lines of inquiry from like the meetup groups. We used to do obviously these presentations in person. Um, I have I had very in, um, informative and enlightening discussions with people who were literally strangers. Like they just got a first impression of me or something that I said, and they'll propose an alternative, and then we get in very fruitful discussions. That's the first half. The second half is it can be very. Um, important to surround yourself with people who, I mean, of course, we all implicitly know this, who just see the world differently. And I guess a more um, methodical, like meticulous approach you can like get, if, if you wanted to get really specific with this is like, I can give you an example um, in terms of like cognitive functions. I know some people have been to other meetups that Shri Khan holds about cognitive functions, it's kind of like a union psychological theory stuff. Um, and for example, um, I don't know, autobiography, 
my lowest developed cognitive function is extroverted feeling. So it's kind of like being considerate or aware of like other people's emotional states and like the soul, reading a, a social room or something like that. That's my lowest in my whole stack. Um, and it, for example, and, uh, and, and ESFJ, that's their first, that's their primary. That's how they see the world through that number one lens. So that can be informative for me and very enlightening to kind of balance me out, if you will, if I if I hang around somebody who just sees the world very differently, like if I'm if I'm an INTJ and they're an ESFP or whatever ENFP, whatever it happens to be, completely different set of cognitive functions, right? They just see the same objective information differently. They're looking for something different. They have different hypotheses about the world. They have a different value structure, and obviously, um, practically speaking, they have different life experiences, of course, as well. So all of that goes into the accumulation of like balancing me out. And like, they'll point out things like, oh, how did you not see that? And then I'll point out like, oh, I was looking for this. How did you not see this? So that's been very informative as well. And like, that's another um, account of what I've learned from like meetups when people who go to meetups, because we've had several um, in, in New York about cognitive functions and, and type theory and all that stuff. So that's been very helpful as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things that we have done in the New York meetups, John, uh, is that it attracts exactly the kind of people who are open and who are trying to improve themselves and who really care about improving themselves. And they would, they very openly, it's kind of joint exploration of ourselves and the world. I mean, that's, that's the theme of the meetup. So what happens is that it just draws people. So even when a person is just stepped in, they, and if they are like that, they say, oh, I can express myself very openly. I can hear whatever other people have. And because that base is taken for granted that all of us are just trying to improve ourselves and any piece of information that will help us, we are, you know, we are grateful for. So I think, I think that's that kind of mindset um, is, is what we have uh, in the meetup and to, to, to a large extent in this group too, there is a lot of, you know, kind of communication uh, of, you know, that is kind of implied. Um, so even if we don't, you know, many of us, you know, now are good friends, but many of us know each other well, many, many people who are new, they kind of see that, that you can openly express yourself and learn from each other. It's not other people's opinions are not taken as an attack. And, you know, it's, it's not, perceived as an attack it is seen as okay what are you what are you saying about the world what are you saying objectively about me or anything let me see if that is true if it is true and if you're correcting me then i will be grateful to you i'll be thankful to you for for correcting because i you know i actually want to be right not seem to be right um all right um i, I want to add one thing please. absolutely and that's and that's one one thing real quick and that's predicated on the idea of like Going back to the, the concluding statement that I that I established, which was um, create, don't complain. It's like you're creating something. You're you're expressing your beliefs. Um, and for everybody here, I I will always remember my literally my very first encounter with Srikant. I was in a meetup on the he did he was doing the um, hundred um, great great ideas. I think we were talking about either language. Uh, or the nature of change, followed by a Maps of Meaning discussion. So this was actually December 2017. Um, and I, I went there, this was like one of my first times in the city for a meetup. And then I went there and then I remember you asked me like, okay, what did you think about like the discussion here? You, you literally, you asked me to express my philosophy. You asked me, you, you invited me to create something, right? You said, okay, spill your mind on this topic. What do you know about Peterson? What do you think about this? What's your analysis of that? Like, what do you think? That's an invitation for, for me to create something, for me to express something. And then like, obviously feel heard, feel expressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here we are hundreds of meetups later. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So on that note, um, John, uh, so let me, let me tell you about some of the meetups coming up and then uh, John will tell you about the next meetup uh, coming up next Friday. So tomorrow, uh, I'm doing a meetup on Buckminster Fuller. He has an amazing approach, kind of systems approach of thinking about things uh, and kind of a comprehensivist approach. So that's going to be tomorrow at 2.30. Uh, day after tomorrow, uh, that's on Sunday at 12.30, I'm doing a meetup on different kinds of dialogue. 
See, most people, when they think they're talking to people, actually they're talking to themselves. They are looking at other people as just kind of tools of supporting whatever they are saying. So the fundamental dialogue is between, it's almost solipsics. It may seem like they're talking to other people, but they are not. What, so that's, that's like the I, I dialogue. Then there is a dialogue I, you, where you're actually trying to see the other person as another I, as an end in itself, in addition to what you're trying to do with them. So having that, then there is kind of us, us dialogue where people are trying to do something together and they completely lose their own identity. They don't have, they don't have a standing ground uh, themselves. So that's like the us, us. Dialogue. Then of course, the most common, there is a lot of us, them dialogue where, you know, you just assume the other person is an opponent. Okay. Then there is the I, it dialogue where you're kind of focused on mostly material things and different people engage in this to different extents. So we're going to def you know, kind of talk about each of these kinds of dialogues and then have a discussion about, um, you know, and you need all of them in various uh, context, but mo many people get them wrong in many ways. So it's a way of kind of exploring the kinds of dialogues. So that's, that's coming up this Saturday. Uh, this uh, Sunday at 12.30. And we have moved the Jordan Peterson meetup that is normally on Thursday to Monday. And there we are discussing Carl Jung and Lion King. So if you're either a fan of Lion King or Carl Jung or Jordan Peterson, so that's like a triple header. Um, and that's going to be uh, this Monday. So that's what is coming up uh, next three days. But John, what's coming up next Friday? Okay, so on the whole theme of self-improvement, I think it's imperative for us to reflect, us to have some general sense of, I guess you could say accountability to make sure we're implementing what we learn because as we all know, knowledge is not power, knowledge is potential power, it must be implemented and executed on. So with all of that in mind as a preliminary note, um, I want to do some sort of a, I guess like a review series, um, looking back on the past, on the, in this case, we're only gonna do a look at the past two meetups. So today, critiquing versus uh, complaining and last week, which was Alice in Wonderland. So we had those four lessons of the Cheshire Cat and the Guidance System, the Bed of Flowers and Alice being in feedback loops, um, the rushes in her boat and the importance of constant striving and then the knight with his head in the hole and um, embrace like hardships as a, as a necess necessity for invention. So those four lessons with this analysis of critiquing versus creating. Next week, we're going to talk about how we either have been implementing them or how we plan to implement them. Maybe some further exploration on terms of little context or, or applications or further questions. Um, so Srikant and I will be um, talking privately about how to organize all this, but we're going to basically look, be looking back on these past two meetups which are Excellent. all available on YouTube, obviously, on, on Trikon's YouTube channel. Excellent. Uh, so, John, thank you very much. And it's always an honor to be doing these meetups with you and, and a delight as always. And thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate you coming. Thank you See very you next much. time. Bye.